we are now at one of my favorite topics in music theory, mode mixture. And the reason I like mode mixture is it, it has this really interesting quality of, of giving you something you expect and at the same time something very unexpected. So let's dig in and see exactly what's going on here. So in a major key, we expect our one chord to be major, two is minor, three is minor, four is major, five is major, six is minor, and seven is diminished. In a minor key, one is minor, two is diminished, three is major, four is minor. So up until now, everything is different. Like whatever was in major, it's, it's a different sonority when you go to minor. You'll notice I put a, a, a dash here, and I didn't put in put in the five chord. I'm going to come back and I'm going to tell you why. You'll notice that six is different, and I the same thing with seven. Now, why did I why did I leave out five and seven? What's what's unique about that in a minor key? Well, as you remember, typically in a minor key we change the key signature. Why well, we don't change it? We add an accidental to change what the key signature does. We raise the leading tone to make it a five chord, uppercase major, and we raise the leading tone to make it a seven diminished. So in these two cases, we are making a chromatic alteration such that the five and seven chord become the exact same sonority as they are in major. If I were to not do that, if I were not to do that, my five chord would be minor, and I'd have a subtonic major triad for my seven chord. Okay, but but this is this is the the norm. Definitely the norm. Not even close. These are not even close to to second having a minor five and a and a major triad seven chord. So, from a certain perspective, you could consider that the 5 and the 7 are borrowed chords from the major key, that we're temporarily borrowing the sonority from the major key into the minor key. And, and some, some music theoreticians uh, will, will call that mode mixture. Now, other music theoreticians don't because it's just so common that we use, we raise the leading tone, and, and they would say, well, scale degree six and seven in a minor key uh, have two different forms. Um, I think it, it's not super important which way you look at it, but that you're aware of this. I, I kind of like the idea of, a, of it being borrowed chords from major, so I would, I would lean towards that, that side of the things, but I haven't given enough consideration to be a hundred percent certain which one I prefer. But but people do make the argument that that may but that the minor mode borrows from the major when it comes to five and seven on a very regular basis. And I can see what I can see that point. That makes sense to me. What's interesting is that when we talk about mode mixture, if we discount that aspect of what we just talked about, it's far, far more common for you to have a major key and borrow from the minor than to be in a minor key and borrow from the major. And the only way you would do that, if we discount this raised 6 and 7, that part of the ascending melodic minor scale that we find when we, we have, an upper, when we have a, a major 5 chord and a 7 diminished, if we kind of use this as, a, as the norm, well, what, what else can we do? Well, we could raise the scale degree three. Um, and so we'll talk about that. So, but but to, to say here, major is our key, and if we lower the third, we lower the six, we lower the seven, those are the notes that make, make that, that minor. And so if we use any of these lowered third, lowered six, lowered seventh, we, we could very easily be borrowing that chord from the minor. So if I'm going along one, uh, let's say I take a chord progression. 
let's take a very traditional chord progression. We start with a one chord. We'll say C major, one chord. Uh, typically, we might go to a six, and then we might go to four, and then two, and then five, and finally resolve to one. Let's hear what it sounds like so we remember the, the, the basics, right? So we start with a one, we go to six, a very satisfying chord progression. Now, what if we were to get to this four chord and say, you know what, we're going to do something a little different. Normally, this would be an F major triad. If we were in C minor, it would be an F minor triad. So normally it's F major in a major key. But if we instead say, you know, I'm going to make it an F minor instead, this would be a borrowed chord because we're borrowing it from the minor version of that key. So we're borrowing from the exact same key, what's called the parallel minor. We're borrowing a chord, and in this case, it would be a minor four. How would that change what we have? Let's listen. That's really dramatic, right? I mean, you hear that, that type of sound is really popular in, in Hollywood movies. Um, that, that mode mixture, especially any kind of um, superhero or epic movie, fantasy genre, um, Lord of the Rings, they love, those composers love to use mode mixture. So here we, we, we borrowed a chord and we, we, we now have the lowered scale degree six. So a point of clarity clarification here. I'm talking about, when I say flat six, I'm saying that what you would, the scale degree six that you would normally have lowered a half step. So you can use the terminology lowered six interchangeably with flat six in this context. Just remembering that you might not actually see a flat in the music. It, it, it might be a, a natural or even a double flat. Because what you're simply saying is you're taking, saying scale to your six, lower it a half step. And you use flat as just a, a kind of a, a placeholder to, to represent that. For frequency, because again, mode mixtures is a little bit unusual. Our, our traditional progression, one, six, four, two, five, one, this is, this is very much expected. If we start using any mode mixture in there, that's going to be a little unusual. But even when we're using mode mixture, there's three distinct levels of how common you find this in music. The first level uses that lowered scale degree six that I was just talking about. And if you do that, if you use the lowered scale degree six, you now have access to a two diminished triad or two half diminished seven, either one. You have access to the minor four chord that I just demonstrated for you. And you also have access to the seven diminished seven. These sonorities you would not find normally in a major key. But it allows us to have just another level of variety. Another level of what's expected, which is these chord progressions, these functions. Because mode mixture will not change the way that chord functions. It still will follow your traditional harmonic progression. And you'll notice, in this case, the roots of the chord are all the exact letter names you would expect. The root hasn't been changed. Um, you, just get a, you just get a different sonority. And that kind of led, leans, led, leads to a, a kind of a, 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 a mysterious quality, a certain exotic quality, uh, a, a, a very interesting aspect to the music. Our next level, in terms of not as common, you got to treat it a little more carefully, 
is when we have the lowered scale degree three. And again, this is all, all of this is dealing with if you're in a major key. So if you have a, a lowered scale degree three, you now have access to the minor one chord. This is not, this is not as commonly done. Because again, if you're going along in a major key and you want to resolve, throwing people a loop just at the moment that they're expecting the resolution takes a lot away from that resolution. So you have to be very careful when you use mode mixture and, and sub in a minor one. It does give you access to the minor four seven because the seventh is your lowered scale degree three. So this is going to be actually a little bit more common than the minor one. And it gives you this, the flat six chord. Now here, you're, don't, don't let this get you uh, too confused. And certainly it's not worth getting upset about. It's actually much simpler than it looks. So normally in the key of C major, if I say C major, scale degree six, write me the letter. You'd write me an A, scale degree six. And if I had a triad built on scale degree six, it would be an A minor triad. So you would write A minor as your lead sheet symbol. You'd give me a Roman numeral analysis of a minor six chord. So if instead I say I want this chord, how are you going to give that a Roman numeral analysis? Well, normally six has an A natural. But since we're changing the root of the chord to a new note that's not in the key, we need to put that accidental before the Roman numeral. So the accidental before the Roman numeral indicates that the root of the chord is non-diatonic. Non so I would write it as flat 6, and it's uppercase because it's a major triad, so it's indicating sonority. The flat before indicates that we're changing the root of the chord to something that's non-diatonic. Up until this point, when you had figured bass, and sometimes you might find some accidentals in your figured bass, they would not be copied into the Roman numeral analysis. And the reason was that you could indicate everything needed by whether something was upper or lower case with your Roman numeral. You just can't do that in this situation where the root of the chord has been changed. Here, you actually do need to have an accidental in your Roman numeral analysis. So, you'll notice that, and it kind of makes sense why, why this, this level, level two, is not as common as level one. Level one, we're just changing the sonorities of the chord. By the time we get to level two, we're messing with a resolution of tonic, and we're changing the roots of our chord to be something that are non-diatonic. So that's it's just less common. It's a little bit more unexpected uh, and therefore has to be treated a little more carefully. We have an even less frequently found, but still important to know about, is when you start using that lowered scale degree seven. Let me just make this really clear for everyone. C major would have C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, scale degree one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So when I say we're gonna alter, alter scale degree seven, I'm saying that we're turning our B to a B flat. And when I said we're gonna alter scale degree six here, that would mean that we were taking our A and turning it into an A flat. So when we do that, just to backtrack and review for a second, when we do that, we could say F, A flat, C, there's our minor four chord, right? That would be our minor four chord. Or we could say um, D, F, A flat, that would be our two diminished triad. Or we could put the C in there and make it a two half diminished seven. And it also would make our, let me use them, our seven diminished seven. So if we went B, D, F, A flat, that would be our seven diminished seven. 
So just by taking scale degree six and making go from an A in the key of C major to an A flat, it gives us those other four chords that I just wrote there and that we talked about here as number one frequency when using mode mixture. When we also say, hey, let's take scale degree three, instead of having it be an E, as we would expect, let's make it an E flat. We then get access to even more chords. We get access to the minor one, the minor four seven, and the flat six. When we add even another scale degree seven, we go from a B in the key of C major to a B flat. We now have access to flat three, which in the key of C major, flat three, you take the third note of the scale, which would be an E, you put a flat in front of it, you lower it. So not always putting a flat, but in this case we do put a flat. We spell a major triad, E flat, G, B flat. So E flat is lower scale degree three. The B flat is lower scale degree seven of our key, right? And so we have that. Now just listen to what that sounds like. If we have one, flat three, back to one. You ever heard that? If you saw any of the Lord of the Rings movies, that's like the number one progression. One going to flat three, Back to one, An exa a perfect example of mode mixture. So it's the least common in, in traditional classical music, but it's, as I said, those Hollywood composers, they love this stuff. They love it because it's awesome. It's really, it, it packs a lot of emotional punch. You also get that flat seven chord. You will notice that the only mode mixture that we don't commonly find. And again, this is like not that common, really not that common, pretty darn uncommon, is a minor five. It is, it is virtually unheard of that you're going along in a major key and then you sub in a minor five chord. That's, that's so infrequent, we just, we just don't do it for right now. We're not even going to think about it. That's how uncommon it is. Let's go to our example here and see what would happen if we, we experiment with some of these other options, right? So we had our chord progression, our, our super, super common traditional chord progression. I did an example of what happens if we subbed in a, a minor four. What happens, what would it sound like if we put in instead our two half diminished seven here? Let's do a compare and contrast again. We'll start with the traditional version of one, six, four, two, five, one. And now we'll use the two half diminished seven instead. can we have? What other options? What if we do one of our less frequent ones, right? Instead of six, like this, let's do flat six and make it major. So let's do the compare and contrast again. Our traditional Again, giving us all these different unique sounds. Now, when I just played that for you on the piano, I didn't have the best voice leading. What kind of voice leading do we expect? Well, the most typical voice leading is, especially if you have that lowered six, is that it is usually prepared by step and resolved down by step. 
you'll notice I'm using phraseology that's very similar to when I talked about non-chord tones. And recognizing that these alterations, in a certain, from a certain perspective, are kind of like non-chord tones. Uh, they, have, they have a certain level of dissonance, and you just can't just jump into a dissonance without any preparation, and you certainly need to resolve that dissonance at some point. Uh, and when I say never, I mean in terms of traditional harmonic progression. Uh, there's always going to be a great composer out there who figures out an exception and a way to make it happen. So, voice leading. You're going to want to, as a main principle, the thing we've talked about over and over, is have smooth voice leading. You want to make it smooth. You'll notice we step up into this borrowed scale degree, and we resolve by step as well. So the voice leading will be smooth. We don't want to jump in, we don't want to jump out. So always remember smooth voice leading, you can never go wrong. Other things that we need to talk about here. Um, that minor mode, you know, when people talk about mode mixture, they're usually not referring to what's so super common of having a, a, a major five chord and a seven diminished. What they're talking about is other things. And the most common other thing is what's called the Picardy third, which is to have an uppercase Roman numeral one when you're in a minor key. Uh, and that's usually at a cadence, at the end of a section, or at the end of a piece. So let me give an example. Here's what you have. You're in a minor key, you're going along. So what did I do just there? I did a traditional, very common, minor progression. I had my five chord, and instead of going to the one that you expected, I went to this one. This is common in the music of Beethoven, and it sounds great. Why is this? Didn't I just tell you it, it, it doesn't work the other way? I was just saying that if you're in a major key and you just all of a sudden go to the minor one, it's it's kind of a it it it, it doesn't doesn't it kind of goes against the resolution that you want there. And that's because minor and major are not created equal. They have very different feelings and they interact differently. So this gets into the area of what's the difference between a minor triad and a major triad. A minor triad is not as resolved as a major triad. This has, simply based on acoustics and human perception, has more tension than this. Now this might be something a little bit controversial to some people. The, the way that I would prove this is that if I take a C minor triad and I compare that to a C major triad, when any, whenever you have notes together, if they are perfectly in tune, they vibrate, you get a sympathetic note a third note for any two notes that are vibrating perfectly in tune. So if you have a C and a G vibrating perfectly in tune, you get another C. You get a third note. And if you have vibrating perfectly a E and a G, you get another note. It's a C. And if you have an E and a C vibrating perfectly, you get another note. It's a G. Then you say, well, are there any of these notes? They're all the notes that are already in the triad, right? So these, these sympathetic notes that vibrate because of the overtone in series, because of acoustics, the notes that vibrate with all those intervals and all the combinations of those intervals are just notes that you were already hearing. This is 
really, really important. Most music theory, theory books don't talk about this, but this is why the major triad is the foundation of harmony and why it is so has such a sense of resolution. The minor triad does not do this. When the minor triad, when you take this C and E flat, which is a minor third, like I had here, this is a minor third, E to G. The minor third produces a note below it. So if you take the lowest note, a, low, a major third down. So if I do that, what I get right off the bat in a minor triad is sympathetically vibrating. You hear a note that's not part of the triad. The human ear is going to hear it is not as resolved. What's so interesting is that the minor triad is still resolved enough that you can hear it function like tonic. But we're talking about very subtle levels of resolution. And that's why, uh, and this is, again, this is what makes music so, so interesting and so amazing is that we're talking about these very subtle, subtle differences that, that we as human beings hear, up, hear and pick up on subconsciously and that, that get turned into emotions. That this interplay of tension and resolution. So that is why you can have this Picardy third in a minor and it works because you're going to resolution and the major triad is just so perfectly resolved. You don't mind that it's not the minor sonority you were expecting. Beethoven loves to do everything big. So when you take this concept and put it into a large scale, Beethoven might start a symphony movement in C minor. And when he goes exposition, development, recapitulation, he might go and have the whole entire recapitulation in the major. Almost like Picardy third for the entire recapitulation. Or even the entire last movement of a symphony. That idea of saying, I'm going to have, and you could consider that mode mixture. Last thing I wanted to mention, the concept of mode mixture versus parallel minor. These are kind of the same thing. Um, a lot of music theory textbooks will say that if you go from C major to C minor, you haven't modulated because your focus pitch, the C, has not changed. You've only changed mode. And they'll say, well, that's not a modulation. Other people could say, well, if we look at the key signature for a C major versus the key signature for C minor, these are two very different key signatures. Can't you say you've modulated? Isn't it a different key, even though the tonal pitch is, is the same? Aren't we talking about a different key signature? And I would say yes. So this is kind of a debate you should be aware of, and that there's a, obviously a relationship between using the parallel minor and going to the parallel minor and mode mixture. Mode mixture is usually when you just dip in for a chord or two, and you're just you know, you're right back into your regular major major key. Parallel minor is when you actually change for a substantial period of time. It's kind of like the differences between saying. Uh, I'm, a, I'm using a secondary function because it's just temporarily versus modulating. Modulation has to have a longer span of time, it has to have more chords in the other key, just like when you go to the parallel minor. Mode mixture, usually it's just for a singular chord or two, not too long, and then you immediately go back, just like when you use a secondary function. So. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, if you have more questions about this, again, this is pretty, this is pretty controversial stuff, uh, but it, it, this, this concept of acoustics is at the foundation of, of what music theory is based on. So it's really important and I figured I needed to at least mention it, um, even if it had to be as brief as I just did. Thank you.